This is the first of my thought vlogs. I'm going to talk about Stephen Johnson's Where Good Ideas Come From. Most of these videos will be summaries of books I've read, although some will be just my ideas. For a long time, I've been frustrated that I would read a lot of books but forget most of what I've read. And so I feel like this is a good way to not only take notes, but also, in the making of these videos, get myself to think more about the material. In fact, part of the inspiration for these vlogs comes from the commonplace books which Stephen Johnson talks about in this very book. I've divided the video into two sections. First is the theory, the big picture stuff, and second is the more practical stuff of how to be more innovative. In his book, Stephen Johnson talks about the seven patterns of innovation, but at its core is the idea that breakthroughs are made building on not in spite of the past. He argues the idea of the lone genius is a misconception. We are often tempted to imagine a gifted mind somehow seeing over the detritus of old ideas and ossified tradition, but ideas are works of bricolage. They're built out of that detritus. This concept is brought to life by the idea of the adjacent possible. That the current possible puts us on the edge of an adjacent possible. Once that adjacent possible is achieved, it opens up further possible possibilities for innovation. A computer programmer in 1904 can do absolutely nothing. A computer programmer in 2004 can build Facebook. Zuckerberg didn't need to invent the computer because someone else did that for him. Breakthroughs enabling yet more breakthroughs. Building on top of itself and defined as Johnson compellingly puts it, by the knowledge you no longer need to have. An example of this is the baby incubator where the high cost and difficulty in repairing mean that this innovation was closed off from the developing world. The people at Neo Nature came up with a solution to build a baby incubator out of car parts because after all people in developing countries had no problem fixing their cars and so should have no problem fixing their Neo Nature baby incubators. What this illustrates is the idea that innovations are born out of their environment. In this case, quite literally using car repair skills to enable repairs of incubators. The second concept is the idea of liquid networks. The question, of course, is how to get to the adjacent possible. Johnson's model of innovation is basically one of making new connections. And what you want is an environment where new connections are made. The analogy for this is the different state of matter. On the one hand is a solid where there is a lot of structure and not that much opportunity to make new connections and the other is a gaseous environment where everything is too chaotic. The sweet spot unsurprisingly is in the middle in a liquid state. This brings us to the four sources of new connections people, activities, error and our own thoughts. Kevin Dunbar, a University of McGill researcher in the early 1990s, was frustrated by accounts of innovation that often seemed too simplistic or inaccurate. What he did was he decided to film researchers in the lab, a sort of reality show on innovation, and studying the video he found that the breakthroughs came not when the researchers were working alone, but rather at the conference table where other people could challenge assumptions and offer fresh perspective from different disciplines. Meanwhile, Stanford professor Martin Roof found that the most creative people are those with broad, horizontal social networks. He found they are three times more innovative than those people with vertical, uniform networks. Interaction outside expertise and organization are critical to innovation. It is not surprising then that this also applies to activities in the same way that interacting with different people increases the chance of creative inspiration, so does doing different things. Throughout history, many of the most creative people had a lot of hobbies. The classic example is Benjamin Franklin, a true Renaissance man. Johnson compares Watson and Crick, the discoverers of the double helix structure of DNA, to Rosalind Franklin also a key figure in the DNA discovery story. Johnson argues that Franklin's relative single-mindedness 
prevented her from making the breakthrough which Watson and Crick's interest in multiple disciplines and fondness for, among other things, rambling coffee breaks had enabled. In short, the dabblers and dilettantes had trumped the expert. Another important influence is the random serendipity of error. One of the most famous examples of this is, of course, Alexander Fleming's discovery of penicillin on a contaminated Petri dish. Another example could be the error that is at the heart of the genetic variation that drives evolution. Charlene Nemeth, a Berkeley psychology professor, conducted a fascinating study to show the importance of error. She asked people to free associate on a colour, e.g. green, but found that most people, of, most of the time, are very unimaginative, saying other colours are most obviously of all grass. Suddenly, though, when she had actors working with the groups intentionally making errors, e.g. for green saying sky or jeans, words usually associated with the colour blue, suddenly people became much more imaginative, saying things like Ireland and money for green. Here you have error literally unlocking the keys to creativity, and Nemeth has found this true in mock juries, boardrooms and even academic seminars. The final important influence is your own thoughts. Remember the breakthroughs come in liquid environments where connections can be made. It's not just about the new ideas. They need to collide with the old for innovation to happen. One of the constraints, unfortunately, is memory. One solution is something like Bill Gates' reading retreats, where a couple of weeks focused reading of a stack of books gives more chance for connections to be made. Another is what John Cleese called thinking time. Cleese, in a video arts lecture on creativity, says how he found it strange that another, who he thought more creative member of Monty Python, would often come up with less original ideas. Cleese's explanation for this is that he would spend more time thinking things through, not taking the obvious solution like his colleague, but just sitting on the problem longer. Of course, again, we come to the memory constraint. As Johnson points out, a lot of breakthroughs are slow hunches, half-baked ideas that come together over time, sometimes years. An analysis of Charles Darwin's notepads finds just this, that Darwin had some half-baked form of his theory of evolution more than a year before it completely crystallized. Regular review of a commonplace book where the author would jot down anything he wanted, a sort of mangled diary of thoughts, often in a quite random fashion, remember liquid networks, allowed a chance for any half-baked ideas to stay simmering on the surface. A more modern version of this would be a program like DevonThink, which systematically brings up again, ever so slightly randomly, old thoughts and ideas put into the database. Or for the less technically minded, Walking isn't too bad either.